Yes, I guess we have been started. So good afternoon or greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining to the special sessions of ESI on ESI webinars on technology and disability trends and opportunities in the digital economy in ASEAN. My name is Lina Molidina Sabrina. I'm the Senior Program Officer uh, at the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia or AREA. Today, together with the other of technology and disability, also distinguished speakers, we will dive in to discuss the role of technology in addressing the barriers and accelerates progress to, towards inclusions and economic empowerment for people with disabilities. But before we dive in onto the discussions, we are very honored to have Ms. Kate, the the first secretary of Australian missions to ASEAN to deliver the welcoming remarks. First, let me introduce uh, Kate. Kate is Kate Goodford is the first secretary economic at the Australian missions to the ASEAN in Jakarta. Previously, she worked as a departmental liaison officer for the former Australian government minister for international development and the Pacific. She was also a member of the branch that led Australia's India-Australia Comprehensive Strategic Partnerships and the Australia-India Comprehensive Economic Cooperations Agreement. She holds a Bachelor of International Studies from the University of Queensland and also studying Master in International Law and Diplomacy at the Australian National University. So, Kate, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, and hello and welcome to all panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real privilege to be with you this afternoon uh, and in the morning, as I understand some of our colleagues on the line are as well. Uh, as Lena alluded to, my name is Kate and I work here at the Australian Mission to ASEAN as our first secretary economic. It's a pleasure to be joining you today for this special session on area entrepreneurship, startups, innovation, uh, technology and disability trends and opportunities in the digital economy in ASEAN. Before I begin my remarks, I'd really like to extend a particular thanks to Ashlyn Cashmore and Nicola Kroshter for their work in developing the technology and disability trends and opportunities in the digital economy in ASEAN report. To everyone on the line, thank you for joining. Your virtual participation in this discussion today is really significant and we appreciate it. It will provide a really important platform to discuss this report further and the technological trends and opportunities that we see impacting persons with disabilities across the ASEAN region. So on the 29th of November, 2022, the Australian Minister for International Development and the Pacific announced a new international development, uh, a new international disability inclusion strategy rather, uh, that would be developed as 2022 drew to a close and 2023 began. The purpose of this strategy is to outline our commitment to promote and protect the human rights of people with disability across Australia uh, including through our foreign policy, human rights, development cooperation and humanitarian work. As with previous strategies, the new strategy will be underpinned by a core principle of supporting an active and central role for people with a disability. However, until the new strategy is finalised, we in Australia will remain committed to delivering the Development for All strategy, which is currently the strategy that we are uh, implementing and engaging with at the moment. So the Australian government also continues to promote gender equality, disability and social inclusion for its foreign economic and development policies. So commencing in 2022 to 2023, the government will provide an additional $470 million in uh, overseas development assistance to Southeast Asia over four years. A component of this funding, which is an estimated $97.7 million, will support gender equality, disability and social inclusion programs. This funding is part of Australia's larger contribution to disability inclusive activities provided through bilateral and global programs. I think important, importantly, however, this really sets the stage for the value that the Australian government places on inclusive bilateral and global programs. Here at the Australian Mission to ASEAN, 
We're honoured to participate and provide remarks in areas special sessions. And I note that the, uh, the 2022 area ESI special session on inclusive education was one in which we supported, uh, which reflected the report delivered by Rabina Singh. So this not only covered the current practices of inclusive education, but also provided cross-cutting recommendations to be implemented across ASEAN and East Asia. This report and this subsequent session was crucial for ensuring students with disabilities in the region were supported to meet their right to equal and equitable education. So today's session provides yet another opportunity to highlight the valuable role digital technology plays in fostering inclusive and economic empowerment for persons with disabilities in the ASEAN region. As identified in the report, despite actions and commitments to improve inclusivity, significant barriers still remain for the inclusion of over 690 million, million people with disabilities in the Asia Pacific region. From my perspective, this report is very timely. We know technology has the potential to negatively disrupt the way persons with disabilities engage with the world. Complicating matters, the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacted persons with disabilities. It created additional structural barriers and social impediments. Action is required from multiple stakeholders across the ASEAN region to fully utilize digitalization to help realize the potential technology brings to improving the lives of people with disabilities. I'd also encourage a need for a holistic understanding of how COVID-19 has impacted persons with disabilities in the region to ensure assistance and support services are effectively targeted. Hence, the report being launched today is so important. It's evidence that stakeholders are coming together, including policymakers, program implementers, donors, government officials, and community members to support reform and progress in this area. Australia strongly endorses and supports areas increasing emphasis on mainstreaming disability and social inclusion in its research and outreach. These are not niche issues, issues and I'd commend area for shining a spotlight on social inclusion. And it's essential to ensure the ASEAN region's equitable recovery, particularly as we move in a post pandemic world. Importantly, to enact change in this space, work must be taken forward, not just by governments, academia, civil society, the private sector, all play a critical role in supporting disability inclusion and providing equitable social opportunities for persons with disabilities. Australia's partnership with AREA provides a platform to achieve this, and we'll continue to ensure our research and analysis provides valuable lessons learned to improve and implement inclusive development and policy practices. So before I conclude this afternoon, I wanted to take the opportunity to commend the authors of this report for shining a spotlight on these matters and for providing recommendations to the policy community and to policy makers to enable leaders to take these matters forward. I would also like to thank the area team for hosting today's event, which Australia is very pleased to be supporting. I wish all participants online a productive discussion, and I very much look forward to working with my colleagues in this field to progress outcomes from today that support persons with disabilities to be heard and effectively engaged in the ASEAN community. Thank you all, and I'll pass back to Lena from AREA. Thank you very much, Kate, for delivering the welcoming remarks. Uh, as mentioned by Kate, today's special session provides an additional opportunity to discuss the crucial role of digital technology in fostering the inclusions and economic empowerment of persons with disability in the ASEAN region. And we are so pleased to have one of the others, uh, Ashley Cashmore, that has who has been conducted the study on disability and tech to examine the trends and opportunities in the digital economy in ASEAN. But 
Before that, before she presented, let me briefly introduce Ashling. So Ashling is the head of impact and advisory at Charities Aid Foundations based in London. She was previously a senior impact advisor at Impact 46, helping the corporates, investors, foundations, and nonprofits to accelerate their social impact. Ashling spent eight years as a senior individual um, consultant to to uh, to help the families and entrepreneurship on navigating the world of philanthropy, helping them to align their assets with their values. She also had six years of strategic communications background. So thank you, Asling, uh, for your timing. And I think without further ado, uh, let's give the floor to Asling. Over to you, Asling. Thank you very much, Lena, and, and thank you, Kate. Um, I'm, I'm really, really delighted to be here today to present the findings of our report um, on, on disability and technology in the Asian region, particularly looking at the trends and opportunities, as well as the role that technology can play in addressing barriers um, and accelerating progress towards inclusion. Um, we're particularly interested in, in three key areas for the remit of, the, of this report, and I don't know if we have the slides um, up so I can, you can see that as well as, uh, as, as well as hear it. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, that would be great. So we, so as I said, we were particularly interested in three key areas for the remit of the, this report. Firstly, whether technology enabled working environments were, environments were a potential game changer, particularly in the context of the changes that we've seen in the world of work after COVID-19 and whether digital jobs and the growing digital economy are proving inclusive and providing opportunities for people with disability. Secondly, we were interested in whether leveraging technology and education has the potential to support learning outcomes and level the playing field for learners with disabilities. And thirdly, we were also really interested in how assistive technology more generally and technology inspired by universal design can transform the lives of people living with disabilities. Over the course of our research and the interviews that we carried out with a number of key experts, some of who are here today and, I'm, and you'll have a chance to hear from them in the panel discussion, uh, we really uncovered a rich range of initiatives in the Asian region, which we included in the report in the form of case studies. Um, over the course of the next 20 minutes, um, I'm going to delve into those three areas of uh, focus. So looking at work and jobs, education, as well as assistive technology, and we'll conclude with some thoughts on how stakeholders in the region can help realise the potential of technology to improve the lives of people with disability and promote inclusion. Um, just before we, uh, perhaps the next slide, please. Just before we delve into those, those three specific areas, I thought it was useful to set out some context um, around disability and technology in the region. And, and also just to mention two points before we start, um, one on terminology and one also on mindset and attitudes. So for the purposes of this report, we use the term people with disabilities as it closely mirrors the official terminology that's used in, in official frameworks across the world, such as the UNCRPD. And we're conscious, however, that some people reject um, this, this terminology, including Darren, who's here, who would prefer to describe um, as people with different abilities, but we're also aware that others would like to accept the word disabled and, and would emphasize that it's not a bad word and indeed that it's society which is particularly disabling for them. So uh, just, to, just to recognize that the terminology isn't necessarily set in stone or accepted by everyone, but what I really would like to emphasize today is that regardless of the terminology, people with disabilities are innovators. Um, when you think about it, they daily break with the norm to find solutions as they're faced with barriers that others do not face. And I think this, this plays into what is really required, which is a, a key mindset shift that needs to take place uh, amongst, amongst everyone and including um, many of the stakeholders across the region, which is that we currently focus on what people with disabilities cannot do rather than what they can do. And we, there's a real clear need to design our society and our economy in a way that's really inclusive for all. 
So just to give you um, a little bit of context on, on disability in, in, in the region, um, people with disabilities are a very important yet highly heterogeneous demographic. So they're estimated to represent about 15% of the global population. And I think Kate mentioned in her, in her speech that this equates to around 690 million people in Asia and the Pacific, according to UNISCAP. So this number is also estimated to grow um, due to aging populations, climate change and growing health conditions. Um, inclusion in the region, in Asian region, as it is across the world, is a key priority. And many of the member states have ratified the international legislation um, and acted, enacted their own strategies. But unfortunately, significant barriers do continue to persist um, in, in this area. Uh, UNISCAP identified a number of key areas of exclusion for people with disabilities, and you can see these outlined in, in the slides um, in front of you. Uh, better understanding of these barriers has been severely hampered by data collection, unfortunately. Uh, and that we've really found in, in the course of our study that the that data has been has been difficult, uh, difficult and it's relatively patchy. So we've drawn on it where we can. But um, it's, this is a, is a clear challenge for policymakers. What is clear, though, is that people with disabilities are for, far more likely to experience poor socio socioeconomic and health outcomes, inadequate access to education, lower employment and higher poverty rates, not to mention the intersectionality with other barriers linked to ethnic background or sex. So looking at the rise of digital technology, because I think it's interesting to give that context as well. Um, over the last 20 years, this has really been happening at a breathtaking pace across the world. Digital technology has broken down barriers to information and, and really broadened access, but it has also exacerbated inequalities. And whilst this isn't just for people with disabilities, this is it's highly likely that they are disproportionately uh, impacted. Um, two key air issues are affordability and accessibility. So there's countries across the region having very varying rates of internet usage and very variations in infrastructure and coverage, which is particularly lacking in, in rural areas. Inclusiveness and accessibility of online content or digital tools is also a problem. Um, just to give you a very concrete example, if you're visually impaired, scanning a QR code is actually quite difficult. Um, Another, another thing we wanted to highlight is digital literacy is really crucial. Um, to give you an example, whilst we don't have figures for people with disabilities, uh, less than 30% of the population in Cambodia has basic dis digital skills compared to 50% in Indonesia, so it's a, it's a differing picture across the region. From our research, however, we noted that there's much discussion, discussion on addressing this digital divide um, in the region, but focused predominantly on women and rural populations. And our impression is that the voices of people with disabilities have been overlooked in, in some respects. So when you consider that the key to future success is digital skills, it's really crucial that people with disabilities are not left behind. If you could go to the next slide, that would be great. So looking at the te um, tech enabled working environments, uh, it's estimated that there are over that there are around 472 million people with disabilities of working age in Asia Pacific, and they are less than two to six times less likely to be employed and more likely to work in the informal gig um, gig economy. And their their inclusion, their sort of their exclusion from this um, from the world of work really comes at a cost, not only to their self worth. Um, but it also comes at an economic cost. So the um, International Labour Organization did some calculations on this and the economic cost uh, in 2006 um, represented 3% of Vietnam's G GDP or 4.6% of Thailand's GDP. But I think beyond that economic cost, you can also, you could talk about a loss of talent, a loss of ideas and a loss of innovation. And I think, we will address those points uh, late, later on. Whilst the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on employment in the region and across the world, um, we did, and, and this also had a, as Kate mentioned in her speech, also had an impact on people with disabilities. We also wanted to look at the, highlight the major step chains that that brought about um, in the world of work. 
um, when you think about digital technology really accelerated the transition to remote and hybrid working environments and it and it normalized and took away the stigma from digital working which um, in many respects has been positive for inclusion because it provided flexibility for people with disabilities especially with digital meeting tools that had accessibility features um, such as open captioning and I think you know we're seeing some of that in this zoom meeting today um, and it has been asked for people you know people with disabilities have been asking for a more digitally enabled and inclusive working working environments and I and the hope is really that this has helped improve accessibility and open up broader opportunities to people with disabilities. Um, however, there's always a flip side, and I think we wanted to highlight that there are risks um, in that in that we're seeing more and more employers calling people back to the office. So there are concerns that those gains have been lost, and also that people with disabilities there is a potential that if uh, remote working is the focus as as for accessibility that they can become isolated at home away from colleagues and also that employers might use this as an excuse to absolve themselves from ensuring that the physical working environments that they that they provide are accessible and are inclusive um, employers in the in the region are required by law to put in place reasonable accommodations to promote truly inclusive working environments and technology really has a key role to play in transforming workplaces and leveling the playing field for all. So that can be AI powered tools um, that can address hiring bias biases, for example, or assistive technology such as speech to text or speech recognition software. Um, we have highlighted in, in this presentation, but there's, there's others in the, um, in the report, highlighted three interesting case studies in the region. Which are um, which are harnessing technology to the end. So in the region and and further further afield, because in this case um, there's case studies from Japan and Australia. Um, so, so the first case study that we wanted to highlight quickly, um, and unfortunately we don't have the time to fully go into these, is um, Steps, which is a social enterprise in Thailand, which is working with IKEA to create a blueprint for an inclusive um, office with a real focus on dispelling the myth that workplace accommodations are expensive. This, this includes an accommodation station that has physical and assistive technology um, that staff can, can consult and that can be tracked to understand which accommodations were consulted and see how the person used them and understand how productivity and performance um, increases. And they're also working in conjunction um, with a university to, to put that in place. We also wanted to highlight uh, a Japanese robotics company, which has launched a robot cafe um, in, in Japan, with, which uh, customers are served by robots that are piloted by people with disabilities. And these, these are often people with severe physical disabilities, who, which impacts their mobility, and they use eye tracking software in order to control the robots and interact with the customers. There's um, additionally, a social enterprise in Australia, which is piloting using Microsoft HoloLens glasses in, as a training aid for people, uh, for neurodivergent people who re often require repetitive training so they can consult the training aid as and when they need. What, what I think is key to emphasize here is that technology can provide lots, there is a real potential for technology to provide tools for inclusion. But I would really like to emphasize, and, and what I said earlier is that that's not necessarily overcoming what is in essence a, a need for an attitude change, that when you think about it, people with disabilities are an overlooked and completely untapped source of talent. And I think that that really needs to come across more. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So look, Looking at digital jobs, um, we there are studies that do show that a diverse and inclusive businesses outperform their peers um, in in revenue by twenty eight percent, and that was a, a study that was done by Accenture. There and there are some large tech technology companies that are recognizing the invaluable skill sets that people with disabilities can bring. Um, SAP's 
autism at work is a really high profile global example of this um, and of embracing neurodiversity in its workforce. Um, there are also growing opportunities across all sector when it comes to digital jobs, and that's not just in technology companies. But I think, as mentioned before, there is a real a requirement for, for digital skills um, and across all sectors, and digital literacy is key in this, as well as socioeconomic skills as well. Um, the, the digital gig economy is a growing area which offers opportunities to people with um, disabilities due to its flexible and home-based nature. And, there, and the, the interesting thing with the digital gig economy is that there's no educational or professional prerequisites. But there is, a, again, a flip side to this in that it offers little social prote protection and guaranteed income. Um, you'll hear from Tantanok a little bit later as she's on the panel, but the Vulcan Coalition in Thailand um, recognised the need for data data labelers in in Thailand as well as the unique skills that people with disabilities can offer and so decided to match the two and, and create a, a social enterprise to do that and they they upskill individuals with the necessary digital literacy that they need and offer um, people with disabilities work as data labelers. Another example is Enable Code in Vietnam which is focused on solving the bottlenecks um, for people with disabilities in accessing employment in the gig tech economy. So particularly with regard to human intelligence tasks, or which are also called HITS, which are basically, uh, for those that don't know, a single self-contained task that you submit an answer to and you're rewarded for. Um, and it works in collaboration and in partnership with Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is the bigger, biggest platform for these human intelligence tasks to identify what training is needed to help develop the skills um, of, of the individuals performing uh, these HIT tasks and increase people with disabilities, earnings and productivity. The, there's also a, a social enterprise in the Philippines called Virtual uh, Halan, which is focused on equipping people with disabilities uh, with the skills that they need to become um, competitive online professionals or entrepreneurs. So these are just a, a few examples, and there's also some interesting examples in, in the study about um, business process outsourcing and social enterprises that have um, created a, around that need and employ people with disabilities to, to corner that market. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, the focus here really is on, on providing skills and education necessary um, and I think that leads us neatly into this, uh, into this um, focus on the role that technology can play in education with really the key question being, can digital solutions and ed tech improve access to education and support learning outcomes for children with disabilities? Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context on, on the, the current situation for children with disabilities when it comes to education, which um, to say the least is highly unsatisfactory, that children with disabilities are more likely to be out of school, have worse attainment outcomes, lower literacy and completion rates than their peers, which has a massive impact obviously on their, on their future prospects. Um, data again is, is relatively patchy on this, but I've, I've highlighted two quite um, stark statistics, which is in Cambodia, one in two children with disabilities are not in school compared to one in 14 of their peers without a disability. And in Vietnam, only 20% of children complete uh, children with disabilities complete primary school compared to 92% of their peers. And um, I think it also, we can highlight that it's even more complicated for girls. What's more um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw widespread, widespread disruption to education with adoption of remote learning strategies, both high and low tech, um, with the pre-existing digital divide further highlighting inequalities. So rates of internet access at home vary highly across the region um, and students with disabilities faced additional barriers, such as lack of additional support, lack of access to assistive devices. And there is a, a real concern about the widening learning gap um, for those for that particular uh, cohort of students. There is, however, anecdotal evidence um, that the switch 
to remote learning was actually beneficial to some children who had mobility issues and who were asking for more remote learning opportunities. But as I say, that's anecdotal. And I think that leads into the, the main point here, which is what is, you know, what is clear is that policymakers shouldn't pass up on the opportunity of the COVID-19 pandemic to examine how distance learning could be designed in, in, a, in a more inclusive way in future and consider the digital divide and upskilling teachers in, in digital inclusive education. It's, it's a massive test case and, it, and they, shouldn't, they shouldn't pass that opportunity by. Um, I think it would be really incorrect to say that digital technology is a solution to all ills. Um, it can't solve some of these structural barriers that children with disabilities face. But I do think that from what we've seen in our report, it does have a potential to facilitate inclusive education. Um, you know, essential assistive technology just on a basic level can, can help level the playing field for students. And there is some evidence of the positive impact of assistive technology on learning outcomes, although this is again limited uh, for the moment and more research needs to be done in this area. Um, you know, very innovative technology also could enhance learning. Um, you know, there's examples of robots used with children on the autism spectrum. But again, affordability remains a key factor here. Um, and there is, you know, ed tech in itself remains the preserve of the more affl affluent consumers in the region. So private schools or wealthier family families. Um, there are There is research that looks at the benefits of investing in phone apps uh because they're they're easily accessible not too expensive and the fact that that te technology can support students in school as well as at home but again there's clearly a, a gap in in evidence for policymakers in, in this area but i would emphasize that that teacher training really is key and and teachers need to be empowered with the right tools in order to support inclusion and need help with digital literacy themselves um, and, it, and it's interesting that we have Nilesh here today from Akadosia because they're focused on upskilling and empowering teachers with the skills that they need to teach in the 21st century. Um, so you'll hear more from him later. Uh, just the next slide, if possible. Um, assistive technology really can transform the lives of people living with disabilities. It, it can allow them to live and learn and work independently and functionally. And this can really range from low tech solutions like hearing aids to high tech solutions such as eye tracking software, which enable web navigation. Uh, inequality to, of access to assistive te uh, technology remains a real issue. Um, only one in 10 have access, whereas an estimated 2 billion will need assistive technology by 2030. Um, key barriers to this really are affordability, stigma, and lack of funding and investment. We, in our research, we were quite, um, you know, we were struck by the fact that there's a distinct lack of investment in developing affordable tech for people in low income countries, or indeed venture capital for inclusive um, startups focused on solving problems when it comes to people with disability. And there seems to be a real lack in the, in the region and perhaps arguably around the world. Um, this is this is a problem that the Disability Impact Fund, which we cited here as one of the case studies, is really trying to address by investing in product development and distribution models for affordable assistive technology. So that's that might be rolling out um, affordable hearing aids in in low income countries, but but really it's focusing on on getting that assistive tech to the people that need it and who can't afford it. Um, universal design sits really at the heart of this and it's a fundamental principle. Um, universal design is the idea that we create products, services, buildings, environments, cities that meet the needs of everyone, uh, that are not just set on a, on a specific uh, norm, ableist norm, you could, you could argue. What is particularly interesting is that um, in some cases the, the distinction between mainstream um, and assistive technology really is blurring, which shows that we're moving in the right direction when it comes towards universal design. Um, to give you a case in point, Audible um, is, is, is an example, or Siri, 
you know, using voice recognition technology, which is now not used, you know, as an assistive technology, but as a mainstream technology. And I think that this is, is just more indicative of the fact that we should really be involving people with disabilities in the design process because we get we there is a lot of innovation and things that can actually be beneficial for all. So universal design again is really important in promoting accessibility and, and inclusion in the in the built environment and, and smart cities are high on the agenda across, across the region. Um, sadly inclu truly inclusive smart cities are not necessarily a reality in, in many places but technology really does have a key role to play in, in this. Um, there's initiatives such as the Green Man Plus in Singapore, which is one example of integrating the needs of, um, of its citizens with disabilities into the built environment. So that's pedestrian crossings that allow people with disabilities or elderly people to take longer to cross the road. Technology really has, um, Sorry, just back one. I've just got one more point on this slide, and then uh, and then we can go to the conclusion. But technology also has a role to play in making other key services, such as financial services, more inclusive. So Bain estimated in 2019 that 70% of Southeast Asian adult population is either unbanked or underbanked, and technology can really be a key driver for financial inclusion. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any data that relates to the experience of people with disabilities. Um, uh, but I think that what we do know is that financial services in the region are behind on accessibility compared to um, European and North American markets. And ultimately, the people with disabilities are a key untapped con consumer that organisations should be thinking about. Um, Kassin Corn Bank in Thailand stands out as having developed a mobile app to help online transactions for people who are visually impaired or elderly, but there aren't many examples in the region at the moment. So for me, it really boils down to inclusion isn't just about ensuring basic human rights, but an inclusive economy and society with inclusive products and services is beneficial to all. Um, we can go to the next slide. So just, just to conclude um, our report and to give you an, um, an outline of the, the framework for action, we have suggested actions based on different stakeholders in the region. Um, governments really have a role to play in addressing the significant data gap that exists. They also have a role in pr promoting accessibility and affordability of connectivity and technology. Um, as well as investing in digital technology in the region. And, and there are examples, uh, sorry, in digital literacy in the region. And there are examples of, of governments doing that, Indonesia being one that has set up um, grassroots community digital literacy initiatives. The private sector should be providing job opportunities and ensuring that their working environments are adapted and inclusive. And, that, and seeing people with disabilities as, a, as an untapped talent base, as well as, as a, a potential consumer. Philanthropy has a real role in fostering awareness, changing attitudes and funding innovation. Um, we also highlighted that impact investors can provide much needed capital for innovation and support social enterprise, enterprises working on these, on these topics across the region, because there is a real gap at the moment. NGOs and social enterprise can also mainstream support for disability and act as exemplary employers. But finally, I really would like to emphasize and think it's really important not to forget that people with disabilities are key innov innovators and stakeholders in shaping inclusion and disability centered design of technology going forward. And we shouldn't forget that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aslin, for delivering the study of areas on disability and tech. Um, because um, today we have already gathered with the some of them who are also involved in this study, who take part also to promote inclusions for people with disabilities in this region. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce first to each of the speakers. 
First, uh, we have Darren Chua. So Dr. Darren Chua is, sorry, uh, there is a, a, a trouble connection first. So Dr. Darren Chua is uh, the inspirational speaker and empowerment coach mindset transformation clinic. And she he was graduated from the University of Singapore with a medical degree at 24 years old in 2000. His goal then was to pursue his medical career towards neurosurgery. However, in that year, he suffered a near stroke that left him half paralyzed over right side of his body and right visual field. Nevertheless, today we see his robust accomplishment that he built Mindset Transformation Clinic, where he trains adults on mindset shift to help people attain peak performance at work and in life. So with a motto, disability is only in the mind, we welcome Dr. Darren Chua. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi. So next we have uh, Rubina Singh. Rubina Singh is uh, the Senior Manager, Research and Thought Leadership at Kite Insights. So Rubina has practiced as a pediatric speech language pathologist for seven years in Canada and for one year in Cambodia at a social enterprise clinic. She has worked with neurodiverse learners and their multi-stakeholders teams made up of parents, educators, administrators, and other specialty professionals such as psychologists and counselors. Rubina completed a Master of International Development from IE University and conducting a study with Area on Inclusive Education as an external consultant in October 2021. Rubina believes that inclusions begin with a mindset and skill set to see disability not as limitations, but a temporary barrier between a person's and the environment. So welcome, Rubina. So the next is we have um, Nilesh Bhatia. Nilesh Bhatia is the founder and CEO of Akadashia. Akadashia is the global community of educators to provide the teachers and educators with better access and better income opportunities. It's based in Singapore, but uh, although it's based in Singapore, Nilesh is a visionary global leader with 30 years of proven experience in the field of entrepreneurship, education, business, innovations, media, and technology. Proven base, strength and accomplishment in entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem design and management, partner and vendor management, educational management, instructional design, business coaching and mentoring, technology innovations and design, audio and video productions. We welcome you, Nilas. Welcome to the session. And the last but not least, who are who is also working on hack and develop the AI disability as a game changer in this industry. We welcome Tanchanok Girafakorn. She is the head of learning and development at Fulkan Coalitions that is based in Thailand. So Fulkan actually is a startup that focuses on developing AI services in Thai languages and improving the quality of life for people with disabilities. So Tan Chanok here is helping the companies drive revenue growth by taking their account management strategies to the next level. So she employs with the communications, client-centric approach, and relationship building capabilities to expand the customer bases and increase sales for a canary manufacturer and a social entrepreneurship startup. So we welcome Tan Chanok to this session. So uh, to begin this panel discussions, I would like to ask the first question to Darren. So Darren, so Dr. Darren, uh, do, you, do you hear me now? Sorry, I think- Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. So the first question is about, as we know that we all are actually has, um, has affected by the, the pandemic we are adapted to a major change in the world of work with the digital technology accelerating the transition to widespread remote and hybrid working environment just like that we do right now. So what do you see actually as the main benefits and risks for persons with disabilities? Over to you, Dr. Darrett. Yes, thank you, Lina. And um, before I start, I just want to 
talk to uh, Ash Ling of fantastic report, fantastic presentation too. Um, when it comes to people with disability, again, I would just want to remind everybody that the minute we use the word people with disability, there is the risk of dividing the world into two groups. Uh, that is the people who, is, who are normal versus the people with disability. And, and that's the reason why I always like to persuade people to think about the idea of choosing another word, and that is people with different abilities, right? Because even if, I mean, I am someone with a disability and I, and I own it, right? But I do believe that even though I am someone who, is, who has a stroke, but I do have different abilities compared to my able-bodied friends, right? I mean, I, I've got a gold medal um, playing wheelchair, table tennis, uh, and a lot of my friends cannot do that. So the, again, we talked about mindset earlier, and I do believe that a lot of times, uh, whatever that we can do is really depending on our mindset. And if we go according to this idea, then really this whole idea about benefits to people with disability, uh, then it, it is actually, that is something that is for everybody, right? I, items about flexibility at work, items about work-life balance at work that people with disability, people who fight for disability talk about, all these items are actually things that we all want. All of us in this world want to have work-life balance, not just people with disability. Anybody, everybody wants flexibility, not just people with disability. So really, I do know and I do believe that the minute we look at the world as a, as a, as a, as a unified place, I do think that actually a lot of things that people with disability, what we want is very similar to the people of the world. The only thing that I think that's distinct is really when it comes to physical barriers, right? I think there is a need um, to reduce physical barriers in the workplace. Um, there is a, um, we, we need to intentionally try to reduce the physical barrier because the minute we realize that then we need to do many things differently to help people with disability to, to be able to do the work that they should be doing at the work. When it comes to um, the risk, right? The risk, I, I do think that the risk really is twofold. The first is really about um, remote work. Um, so remote work has been said that over the past few years in 2020, 2021, remote work has been sort of like said that, you know, it has been the main thing that has been helping many, many people with disability to be able to get back to work. But at the same time, it is also, and, and my, my fear is that the remote work can also be a barrier in getting people with disability back to normal life when the pandemic is over. Because even now, as we move out of the pandemic, many people, people with disability, people with different ability, they are very comfortable with what they're doing. And uh, that is the risk that I see. Another risk that I see is inadequate support from employers. And this is something that I felt, uh, especially uh, the first few years after my stroke, when I first started going back to work, right? Um, the, the employer wanted to help me by, going, by, by putting me in a place at work, but there was no support. In, in other words, the idea was to help Darren to get back to work, but there was not intentional thought and there was no deep thought as to how the employer can support a person like me, a person with different ability, a person with uh, disability, as to how can they help me to empower me to be better at work. So these are some of the things which I feel that we should be thinking about, that we should be talking about. Thank you. Thank you, um, 
Darren, for sharing your insights. So actually the digital transformations has offered a flexibility for all of us, including uh, the people with disabilities as well. But there is a risk to reducing uh, the physical barriers in the workplace as we are currently shifting again to the real yes. offline work. Okay. Yeah. So um, moving ahead, I would like to ask to um, Rubina. Rubina, um, so the question is, uh, it's not only about the hybrid working, but also during the pandemic, there is a robust development of hybrid learning and online learning as well. So the question is, what is your actually the perspective on the readiness of the current educational landscape to provide learners with disability with digital related skills? So over you. to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, thank you, Aria, for having me as a panelist um, today. And congratulations to Ashlyn Cashmore and Nicola Crosstown on a fantastic report um, and very timely as well. Um, just to pick up on and build on what you just said, Darren, I couldn't agree with you more that really the beginning of, of any work that we do in this topic starts with a shift in mindset. And while the mindset is so important to be to shift so that we are open, there's actually neuroscience behind why that's crucial in order for us to make any um, progress in this in this space. So for instance, if you have a closed mindset to a topic, it doesn't matter how much you learn about that subject, you are prone to uh, rejecting that information or not actually following through with it. And this, and when your mindset is open, even if you are learning information or, or um, tools or strategies that you've never thought of before, um, that's really when you get to uh, think more creatively about how to embed those, those pieces. And it, it's um, such an important um, beginning to any of this work because it's normal for any human to look for things that match with what you already know and it's quite normal as well to reject what you don't know so i i, I commend you on your work that you're doing uh, dr darren because this is really an important start um, for many of us so um let me also start by saying that uh, there is good news in the ASEAN space, and that good news that we've talked about is that all of the ASEAN member states have aspired uh, to make education systems more inclusive, and we can see this because they've all made commitments to international and region, regional agreements, national frameworks, laws, policies, etc. And this is a very good starting point to show a collective agreement that this topic is important and also signing of tools, et cetera, uh, and frameworks that keep them accountable. Um, and what really, what we need to be also doing is celebrating the work that's done throughout the region so that we can highlight some of this, this good progress that's being uh, uh, conducted in the space. Um, and so I, to answer your question, Lena, uh, you know, the long-term goal of inclusive education is really to support the development of students, not only academic skills, but also their social skills, so that ultimately they can be socially, politically, economically engaged later in life. Um, but we know from much of the research that Ashling has done and the research that I've done on inclusive education in, in ASEAN, that there is a gap between this vision that we have um, and what is actually happening on the ground. And unfortunately, we also know that students with disabilities are often left out of educational design. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an important place that, um, again, with the mindset of being open to educational design that's inclusive and accessible right from the beginning, this is where we can make a truly uh, significant impact. So the readiness of the current educational landscape in ASEAN to provide learners with disabilities with digital related skills is varied. Um, so while some countries have made progress in making their education systems more inclusive and accessible to learners with disabilities, others still have a long way to go. Um, and an interesting finding that I found across the region, um, and I think Ashling has touched on this too, is that the definition of inclusion varies country by country. Um, and it's so important when we're talking about inclusive education that we know what that is. And we have a shared understanding of the term of the concept in order to apply it 
in a universal way. So for instance, while many schools report that they have inclusive practices, when you take a closer look to see what these systems are, they're actually using different models such as integrated or segregated models of learning. Um, so for instance, integration implies that students are physically in the school, uh, but the system of education delivery hasn't changed. So there is no individualized support. The teaching staff aren't actually meeting the students' needs. Um, and an inclusive system is one in which a student has access to quality learning from the mainstream curriculum that's adapted to their individual learning methods. Um, and often it comes with adapted materials as well. So um, I want to touch on some of the, the trends that uh, Ashlink has mentioned in technology and digital infrastructure. And we do see that there's many ASEAN countries that are investing in, in technology and digital infrastructure and education. Um, but there's a real need to make these systems accessible to learners. So this includes designing digital platforms, tools, websites with accessibility features, as well as providing assistive technologies and training for teachers and students with disabilities. Um, and often it's the lack of understanding, awareness, or training among educators in ASEAN uh, to support students with disabilities in a digital learning environment that we see as, the, as a barrier. Um, and so I'd like to highlight five um, steps that uh, we can take within the education system to really increase the capacity of teachers ability to provide learners with uh, disabilities with digital related skills. And so the first is professional development. Teachers need ongoing professional development opportunities to learn about the latest assistive technologies and strategies for teaching students with disabilities in a digital environment. Um, and this training should also cover accessibility issues and how to make digital learning environments inclusive for all students. Number two is access to resources. Teachers need access to the latest technologies, hardware and software that can help learners with disabilities to participate fully in digital learning. And this includes assistive technologies such as screen readers, speech to text software and alternative keyboard and mouse devices. The third element is inclusive design. Um, and the real push for this comes from ministries. Education systems should ensure that digital learning environments and resources are designed with accessibility in mind. And this includes creating digital platforms, tools, and websites that are usable for a range of abilities, as well as providing training to teachers to make these resources more accessible. The fourth step is collaboration. So here teachers are encouraged to work with each other and share best practices with each other so that other professionals, um, as professionals, they can work with students with disabilities in a more cohesive manner. And this can really also create a, a network of support and expertise that can be leveraged to improve these outcomes for, for all learners. And the final uh, step is a student-centered approach. So teachers can adopt here a, a system of teaching that puts the students' um, needs, their learning at the center, focusing on the needs of each student's strengths as an individual student. Um, and this approach can be applied to teaching students with disabilities in a digital learning environment, taking into account their specific needs and accommodations. So these are um, some um, thoughts on how we can make uh, education systems more inclusive and how um, learners with disabilities can have access to digital related skills. Over to you, Lena. Yes, thank you, Rubina. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, um, as well as the key tips to promote inclusive educations in, the, in this region. And uh, I guess Rubina has already touched upon the regional perspective challenges, uh, the key barriers that is facing on the persons with disabilities, but um, we have two entrepreneurs here who are really on effort to make an inclusion in this region. And we would like to know actually, uh, what is their perspective of the existing barriers uh, faced by the persons with disability to have not also equal and equitable access to education, but employment based in each countries in Singapore and Thailand. So we have here Nilesh, 
um, and Tanchanok. So maybe I would like to give the floor first to Nilesh. Nilesh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. And also uh, congratulations, uh, Ashling and Nicole for the awesome report. Um, and also thanks to uh, Aria for inviting uh, me to be on this panel today. Um, I think as far as uh, Singapore is concerned, uh, I mean, just like most countries in ASEAN, uh, there are a lot of efforts being made uh, by uh, the, the, the schools uh, here um, to help, um, and I will borrow, borrow the term from uh, Dr. Chua, to help uh, uh, people with different abilities, right? Um, but there is still a lot um, desired. Uh, for example, um, in the education sector, often we find there's a lack of, uh, you know, uh, good accommodations and support services and specialized equipment or assistive technology needed for students uh, on campus. And uh, sometimes even uh, there is a, a lack of dedicated support staff, um, uh, which is which is uh, which is quite a bit of a problem sometimes, uh, you know. There's a, a definite lack of awareness and understanding. And I think uh, to um, uh, kind of uh, highlight once again, Rubina's point about teacher training. And I think this is exactly where teacher training comes in because a lot of the teachers themselves are not sure as to what to do in class. You know, I mean, if you have um, students with uh, different abilities, uh, you know, how do you tackle this? How do you handle this? And in fact, that's one of the main challenges that we've been tackling with, uh, you know, when we work with teachers across uh, Southeast Asia. Um, we've also seen, uh, unfortunately, discriminatory attitudes uh, and stereotypes, uh, which is um, very unfortunate. Uh, but again, it all goes back to uh, training. Uh, you know, if, if teachers are well prepared, uh, then, uh, you know, they will be able to uh, resolve uh, those uh, discriminatory attitudes and stereotypes in the classroom. Uh, and unfortunately, kids can be quite cruel sometimes. And, uh, you know, if the teachers don't really know how to handle those issues in the classroom, it can be quite a traumatic experience uh, for, uh, you know, the person on the receiving end. But apart from that, on the, on the education technology uh, front, um, I think, uh, again, just like any other country, Singapore also has the same issues. I mean, you know, if you're looking at uh, education technology tools and platforms, not many ed tech tools out there are designed uh, from the ground up for, uh, you know, students uh, who need, um, you know, extra attention in that sense. Um, in fact, uh, um, there is a severe lack of platforms with, uh, you know, keyboard accessibility or poor contrast ratios, or even absence of audio descriptions of, uh, you know, of the visual content. So even if you move uh, into an online realm, what happens? Uh, you know, not necessarily that all, um, students with a different ability would uh, be able to still access that content. Um, there is also inadequate assistive technology. Uh, you're looking at, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the, the main problem here is the cost. Uh, the cost of deploying these assistive technologies into, uh, into um, ed tech platforms at the moment is still quite prohibitive. So that is a, is a, is a big issue. Right. And um, so, uh, you know, unless and until the cost doesn't come down, how are we then going to, uh, you know, help the students who really need, uh, uh, you know, this this access. And finally, uh, it's also limited the technical support. Um, I mean, uh, there's a lot of teachers who are just suffering, uh, not I'm sorry, not suffering, but struggling with just using regular education technology today. Uh, I've encountered teachers who have, you know, major issues just figure, just figuring, you know, like um, figuring out basic education technology. Now, I think that's the first barrier to cross before we even start looking at assistive, uh, you know, uh, technology and support, because if the teachers don't even understand basic education technology, how are they going to then support other students? So those are some of the things that I feel, uh, you know, uh, that a lot of schools, um, uh, you know, have issues with in Singapore and not just in Singapore, but I would say pretty much across the region, because we are dealing with teachers uh, at Acadasia, um, you know, with teachers from all around the, the region at the moment. So, so those are some of the challenges I, I've, I've come across. Thank you. Thank you, Nilas, for sharing your thoughts. 
Um, I think um, Ashling also highlighted in the report that it's very crucial to promote the uh, investment to make it the average uh, the assistive assistive technology to be more affordable. So it's clear that the gap is also existed in Singapore. Over to you, Tanchana. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, um, for me, I think um, there's uh, definitely a correlation between um, education and earning, like getting a job. Um, and of course, um, there are many barriers faced by um, people with disability when uh, seeking employment. Uh, personally, I think um, there are two main factors and root cause of this issue. Um, first is um, the lack of in information and awareness of the companies um, considering the employment of people with disabilities. Um, looking into the perspective of employers or the company side, um, I believe they are now um, uh, I'm aware of inclusion and diversity in the workplace, but um, there's still lack of the correct understanding of um, the potential and limitations of um, people with disabilities. Um, the company might want to hire disabled people, but um, the key of school is that they don't know what disabled people can do or what position in the company that um, they can fit in. Um, in in Thailand, there's a law that um, requires an organization to hire uh, one disabled person for every hundred employees. In the case that um, the, the company doesn't want to hire disabilities by themselves, they have two options. First, um, either they send money to the national fund or hire disabilities for um, social subcontract services, um, which is um, uh, the section 35. And um, right now, the total number of people with disabilities of working age in Thailand is about um, around 850,000 people, but only 36% of them are in employment. Um, this proportion clearly shows that the company is still not success in employing um, people with disability in the workplace. And I think um, the things, um, what we can do and we need to do right now is to um, communicate and provide more information for the company to understand more about the limitations and uh, the potential of people with disability so that they can create a working ecosystem that um, people with disability can work and can support them to work. And um, another factor, um, the, the second factor is that the lack of skill sets of people with disability to work in digital world today. Their skill sets um, don't match, I think still don't match the needs of business sector right now. Clearly in uh, the, the training program in Thailand, still uh, that, that provide for people with disability is more, mostly I can say like yesterday skills that won't match um, in this fast changing digital world anymore. Um, imagine in Thailand, we still train um, them to do the massage thing for the, the massage, uh, for the massaging services. Yeah, and that doesn't like um, serve the, the demand in business sector anymore. And um, if they want to, to upskill or rescue themselves, um, they can learn. For non visible people like us, um, we might answer easily that um, we might uh, do some course online. But we know that um, online learning platform are available in Thai market in, in Thailand right now is still not that accessible for disabled people. Um, and I think it's, some of them might be usable, but not that friendly to them, especially for, for, for blind people. So um, I think in order to like um, prepare them to, to meet the demand of the business sector, um, the training and teaching in education system should like focus more on digital related skills and uh, in, in order to equip them directly to, to the demand of the business sector. And also the tools of um, their learning should be accessible and usable for, for people with disabilities. Thank you, Dan Chana. Yeah. So uh, both Nilas and Tanshana also highlight the lack of uh, skills for teachers to prepare uh, the 
persons with disabilities to really uh, engage in the societies. So <clears throat> moving ahead to the second round, I would like to address the, quest the second questions again to Dr. Darren Chua. So Dr. Darren, um, well, we're, yes. we're, our report is about the tech and there is a really, uh, the tech is really evolving right now. For instance, there is an AI on speech to tech technology, speech recognition software, and another assistive technology that can help the persons with different abilities to succeed in the workplace. So uh, what is your perspective on that? Over to you, Dr. Durant. Thank you. I think when it comes to tech, um, before we even look at tech, I think we need to look at one other thing, which is I think more important. And that is the idea that really it is about helping people to be empowered, to help them to release themselves, to release their, their talents so that they can be fully empowered, so that they can live a meaningful life. I think ultimately this is the goal that we are trying to do here. So it is not so much about the tech. The tech is helping us to reach that goal. So it is not so much about the technology, which is the end goal. I don't think technology is the end goal. I think the end goal is to help people with different abilities to be empowered so that they can be fully, so that they are able to live a meaningful life fully. And I think as long as we are aiming towards the target, Whatever that we are doing right now using tech, it's a, even if it's a simple step, I think it's the correct step forward. I think the other uh, point that I want to add here is really about mindsets, which I think many people in the panels have spoken about. It is really about mindset. And when it comes to mindset, there are also two groups of people that I think we need to talk to. And I think many people are talking about the employers. And I think, yes, employers need to have the correct mindset, but also the employees themselves need to have the correct mindset. Because as someone who is, as someone who is adaptive myself, right? I mean, I, I call myself as an adaptive individual, um, disabled, adaptive individual. I, I find that a lot of times I need to change my mindset so that I can think the correct way so that I can then move and then be fully empowered to do the things that I want to do, right? So sometimes it is not so much about the technology. The technology can be there, but if I do not change my mindset, then you know, even no matter how good the technology is, sometimes it may not even help, right? So I think two things here, it is really about understanding about helping people to be fully empowered and then also understanding that mindset, it's not just about the employer's mindset, it's also about the employee's mindset as well. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Darren. So the key is still about to changing the mindset before we dive in into the technology itself. So it's not only for the persons with different abilities, but the mindset to all of us. So thank you. And maybe to save the time, um, Rubina and Nilash, I would like to address these same questions to you because both of you are working at the same issues to promote inclusive educations. So uh, Rubina and Nilash, the question is, um, Rubina, you mentioned, for instance, in the report that the participation education for children with disabilities is dropped like 52.7% in the primary and secondary school. And then Nilash, you work on the Akadashia that promote the vision to empower teachers with tech and digital skills. So in both of your perspective, how is the role of tech itself enabling the more inclusive learning ecosystem resulting to a better students outcome, especially for people with disabilities. Over to you, Rubina, first. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, for that question. Um, I think overall technology can play a really key role in motivating learners uh, with disabilities and improving their outcomes. And it can do so in, in particular ways. 
and I'll talk about what those ways are. But I think before um, before we jump into them, I think I'd also like to highlight the importance of a, a clinical assessment on students who have disabilities, because it's really important to understand their cognitive abilities, um, including their abilities to work with the technology, to be able to um, physically work with it, whether it's turning it on, using it, turning it off, et cetera, their attention span and how much they're able to process in a, in amount of, uh, in a certain amount of time. And having that baseline information is going to be important to make any program with technology more efficient and more useful for that learner. Um, and this is why um, the role of assessment, the role of uh, uh, developmental assessment, psychologists, speech language pathologists is really important here in setting a, the groundwork for how technology can be used. But, it, and this is unfortunately uh, a barrier in the ASEAN region, there isn't a, it always is an easy accessible way of getting this kind of information that kind of this kind of data and for um for those who know about the the Washington consensus group and this is um, another um another model that can be used to do some of this assessment that's really based on a functional uh presentation of disability so it isn't clinical in the sense of how you're presenting um, from a medical perspective, but it's much more uh, function-based. Um, so I recommend looking into this model of the Washington Group UNICEF Child Functioning Module um, that can really help identify children who have difficulties and um, and help them in, at, at a functional level. So the points about how technology in particular can really motivate a student to, in learning, um, I think there's several. So the first is personalized learning. Technology can provide personalized learning experiences that cater to the unique needs of that student. Um, and this can help to increase motivation and engagement as the students get to work at their own pace and they received tailored support. Another is of course, what we've been talking about this entire presentation is accessibility. So assistive technology such as screen readers, speech to text software, alternative keyboard and mouse uh, devices that my federal panelists have shared, they could really create um, access to educational materials and allow students to participate in the digital learning environments. And this is a key um, point because uh, all technologies, they can be adapted in ways in order to meet the needs of the learner. Um, the technology as well as create, can create an interactive and engaging environment. So technology can create um, educational experiences that really allow students to benefit from interaction that who may struggle with traditional classroom activities. Like for example, gamification simulations can help make learning more fun and more appealing. Um, the other part of technology is that it can create uh, connected learning and students from different geographies or different areas can come together and collaborate and communicate more easily with one another. Again, really important to foster a sense of community and belonging to improve social skills and emotional well-being. And the last piece touches on the first piece that I was saying, which is about the diagnostic measure of, as, um, of uh, learning with a disability. Technology can also improve assessment. So technology can support the assessment of learners in a more accessible, inclusive manner. So for example, online assessments can be adapted to accommodate different accessibility needs and provide instant feedback to help students learn more effectively. I'd love to hear more from, uh, from you, Nilash, about your thoughts and thank you. Yeah, well, thanks, Rubina. Thanks, Rubina. And uh, I completely echo with you on on everything that you've said. I mean, you know, uh, I think um, it's absolutely true that the technology, you know, has the potential to actually do a lot of good, um, you know, to to serve uh, the needs of the students uh, and the teachers. However, it's still not being done. So maybe what I'll pr probably present is a different perspective on why it's not not being done you know all the technology is there why are they still not using this technology and i think the answer the the, the two the two particular things here one is like what uh, dr chua mentioned earlier it's about mindset um you know um, unfortunately i mean if you if you if you really look at the employee mindset in a, in a school um what is the incentive for the teacher to upskill you know really i mean that's something that a, that's a question that 
that a lot of people are trying to answer. Why should a teacher upskill? I mean, I'm in the business of you know supporting teachers and upskilling them at scale. And a lot of teachers actually come to me and tell me, why, why do I need to upskill? Uh, why do I need to pay for this? Uh, why do I uh, need to do this? Because you know I hardly get uh, you know a decent wage to begin with. I can barely cover my own expenses. And now you're asking me to invest an additional time and money uh, when I could be doing other things. Uh, so that's a you know that's a big uh, problem, and I think that needs to be addressed at a at a uh, you know government level. Uh, they need to start allocating more budgets for teacher training. They need to start paying teachers you know decent salaries, uh, you know which which teachers can be proud of. I mean, I think a lot of teachers join the the industry because they have the heart to teach. They want to help students. Uh, but when you when you are in that system for two, three, five, 20, 30 years, um, you get jaded. And I've seen a lot of good teachers getting jaded by the system more than anything else. And then the whole mindset changes. And, you know, initially you find all these young new teachers who are very, you know, gung-ho by the time they reach, you know, 10, 15 years into their service, uh, they're very jaded and they have different ways of looking at things. So mindset, the only way to change that mindset is going to be when, you, when we all as a society start really addressing these issues first. How, you know, why should the teacher upskill? What is the motivation? And address those challenges. That's first. The, the, the second is, of course, cost. As I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of the education technology is still very, very prohibitive. Um, in fact, in, uh, in Asia, we can see that, you know, you can already see uh, this wide gap between private and international schools and the kind of technology they have access to versus public schools. Uh, a lot of public schools have no uh, access to technology. Maybe during the pandemic, they perhaps got, you know, got access to an LMS, but that is it. That's all they had access to. Uh, so, so those are some of the, uh, you know, uh, big issues I mean, especially when you start looking at not just, uh, you know, providing technology to people with different abilities, but also generally to make e education equitable across the board. You know, the cost of, of technology needs to come down. And uh, as an edtech founder, I would actually urge all other edtech founders out there to really start looking at, you know, how you're building technology. I mean, it's one thing to have this great tech, but if it can, if it is only... Uh, you know, providing benefit to a select few, then what good is it? Uh, you know, if, if something that works, uh, it should work for all kids, regardless of, you know, race, religion, creed, uh, you know, ability, you know, it should work for everybody. And that unfortunately is not happening, which also leads me to, you know, again, government regulations. Can government put in regulations to say that education technology in schools must have certain things which um, help uh, not just students with different abilities, but generally all students, you know, from, from different strata of society as well. Um, I think that those are the two main issues which I encounter almost on a daily basis when I work with school administrators and schools in terms of motivation, in terms of the cost of technology. If these two things can be changed, I think whatever Rubina mentioned, I think technology is great. We can do a lot of good things with it but it needs to be affordable and people need to start believing in it. Uh, they need to have a reason to adopt it uh, in their campus. So, so those are my two, two things over there, yeah. Sure, thank you. As long as I wanna prolong this discussions, uh, I'm sorry that we're running out of time, but uh, the key message is like, uh, we have to make the affordable, ensuring the affordable technology for all. So, Speaking of technology, actually, Tan Chano also working on developing the AI tech based for people with disabilities. Uh, so to uh, to be the bridge towards the discussions, Tan Chano, over to you to share what is you're doing uh, on Fulcan mm -hmm. of the AI tech. Thank you. Yeah. Um, at Obarkan Coalition, uh, actually, we are an AI technology company um, driven by uh, people with disabilities. Um, our AI product um, powered by disabled people. Um, at first, we start by um, seeing 
two problems in, in, in this world that we want to solve. First is um, the inequality problem of disabled people that they don't have employment opportunities. And the, the, the second is the huge lack of the data to develop AI models uh, to be smarter and help human even more. Um, at first, we, we try to solve these two issues. Um, we do the research. Um, we, we find a research paper from, from Canada about brain rewiring. Um, it's about the transformation of the unused brain area to help um, normal organs. Uh, for example, the brain of those uh, who are blind, they make new connection in, in the absence of visual information, resulting in a greater ability of hearing sense. And um, yeah, if I can give you an example to, to make you uh, understand more of, um, of this superpower of this group of people with disabilities. Um, the blind people, they can process audio, audio input twice faster than normal people. They can like listen to a podcast at a 2x and 3x speed faster than, than us. And also for the deaf, they have wider eyesight and be able to see details better than us. And um, another group of disabled people that we work with is um, autistic people as well. They are good at recognizing patterns and can concentrate on things of their interest. Um, after we found this, um, this um, superpower, I would say superpower of this group of people, and uh, we can, we can like, uh, give them a job. Not only the, the research paper that we found, um, we also do the field study by ourselves as well. We um, have the group of live students at um, Thomas Hart University in Thailand. We let them try labeling the voice data. And it was a super surprise that they can do like, like um, they, their productivity of doing the data labeling is like better than ours. So uh, uh, after like the field study and also um, the research paper that we discovered, um, these results like can clearly emphasize that people with disability are super talent and they, they have potential and we can create a job for them. Um, and with the, the, the law in Thailand as well, like as I mentioned earlier that um, in Thailand, we have a law that um, mandate organization um, with the ratio of like, um, if their company have um, 100 employee, employees, they need to hire at least one people with disabilities. However, if, if like um, the organization don't want to, to hire directly, to hire PDPD directly, they can like um, contribute, like put the money to the national fund under section 34 or like support their um, employment of people with disabilities through um, the section 35, which is like hire them under service, social service subcontract as well. Um, after we see this um, regulation in Thailand, we discovered the opportunities um, from the latest section, which is um, section 35. And we work in cooperation with um, business partners by recruiting um, people with disability to work as an AI trainer. And this like initiative creates like a win-win relationship among three parties, which is like business sector um, can support disability employment um, in compliance with the law and um, people with, disabil with disability can get a job and um, receive income directly. And third is Vulcan ourselves. We can build, um, we build it as such to develop AI model and sales um, to our clients as well. So um, in order to, to become an AI trainer for disabled people, they must, um, they must participate in a digital skills and training program first. They not only like, um, learn the basic knowledge about the AI, but also need to um, learn how to work as a data leveler. We decided to create um, our own working platform, um, including like accessibility features, which allow like people to work efficiently, regardless of like disabilities. Each, um, as, as, you, as you guys know that um, each disability group, they, um, they have, their own limitations uh, to, to work, like um, for blind people, they need to um, use generator in order to, to do, the, to do the, the computer, right? And also um, other group of, uh, other group of disability as well. For, for example, like, um, like um, deaf people, uh, even like 
they they can see they cannot read um in um they understand like Thai language as their second language. It's not their mother language. Their mother language would be like um a hand sign language. So after we like um understand that this type of limitation, um we can create um like a learning tools for them and also a working ecosystem for them that they can work like efficiently. So um in in the past year, so can we hide um we, we train almost two thousand of people with disabilities and hire them and, and hire them like around um six hundred of people with disabilities to work as uh, AI trainer. Um after we, we work with this uh, largest group of people with disabilities, we know that um if we understand their limitation and we understand their potential of working, uh, we can create a working ecosystem for them that they can actually like um show their talent and show their potential to work with their like their, their skill. Not um not only hide them out of PD, but um we can create a job for them and use um to do work. Yes, and here is all about um the work that we do to to support um people with disabilities. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Tanchino, for delivering uh your input. Yes, so it's uh so it's clear that technology actually uh can help, but Actually, the basic uh, the basic problem is always about changing the mindset as well. So once the mindset is changing, uh, technology can accelerate the changing in the more inclusive uh, environment for people with disabilities. Uh, but before we close up, I know that Asling want to uh, want to say a word about this. So Asling, uh, over to you. Thank you, Lena. I, I thought it was just worth um, thanking the panel because um, I think there's been some really excellent and interesting comments from, from Santanok, Rubin and Nilesh and Dar uh, Dr. Darren. I think that um, your perspective, perspectives and expertise have been have been shared and it would have been great to hear more from you. Um, I think we, we're running out of time, but I just wanted to thank everyone who participated and listened today. I'd really encourage you to go and read the report because um, there's a lot more that we weren't able to cover in this session. And, and for me, the, the key things to leave you with is really technology has a, a great potential in terms of fostering inclusion in the region. But I think as everybody has agreed and, and that has come back as a consistent theme is mindset needs to change and attitude towards people with disabilities. And um, that that is something that uh, that definitely needs to be worked on. Um, I'll 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 leave you all now. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Asling. So thank you very much again to all of the great panelists to Rubina, to Nilis, to Daren, Chua, to Tanchanok, Jura Fakorn. We are very happy to have you here. Uh, so this uh, this webinar will be recorded and will be posted at our website. So thank you very much again for all the audiences as well. Thank you.